consciousness has now grasped the notion of itself, which to begin with was only our notion of it. That is, that in its certainty of itself it is all reality, and end and essence are for it, henceforth the spontaneous interfusion of the universal, of gifts and capacities, and individuality. The individual moments of this fulfilling and interfusion prior to the unity in which they have coalesced are the ends hitherto considered. These have vanished, being abstractions and chimeras belonging to the first shallow shapes of spiritual self-consciousness, and having their truth only in the imaginary being of the heart, in imagination and rhetoric, not in reason. This, being now absolutely certain of its reality, no longer seeks only to realize itself as end in an antithesis to the reality which immediately confronts it, but, on the contrary, has the category as such for the object of its consciousness. In other words, self-consciousness determined as being for itself, or as the negative self-consciousness in which reason at first made its appearance, is set aside. This self-consciousness came face to face with the reality, supposedly the negative of it, and only by overcoming it did it realize its end. But since end and intrinsic being have proved to be the same as being for another and the reality confronting it, truth is no longer separated from certainty, no matter whether the proposed end is taken as certainty of self and the realization of it as truth, or whether the end is taken for truth and the reality for certainty. On the contrary, intrinsic being and end, in and for itself, are the certainty of immediate reality itself, the interfusion of being in itself and being for itself, of the universal and individuality. Action is in its own self its truth and reality, and individuality in its setting forth or expression is, in relation to action, the end in and for itself. We're now entering the third and final section of this massive, over 200 paragraph reason section of the, the work. And here in paragraph um, 394, and then the two paragraphs yet to come, we have an introductory section for this individuality which takes itself to be real in and for itself. And, and there's a little bit to be said at this point, some of which is, I think, by way of reminder for those who've been following along with this commentary about um, some of the ways in which Hegel's work tends to transition. Um, there's really two things I want to bring up. One is that each section begins where a previous section ended, but there's always going to be a little twist to it. So we're going to see some of that going on here. The other is that um, Hegel quite often likes to frame things in terms of, of self-certainty, truth, and then the return to truth and self-certainty together. Or in this case, we've been you know, looking at reason. Reason started out with observational activity and didn't take into account its own self in doing so, although by the end it's, you know, looking at things like the physiognomy and phrenology and human action. And then it transitioned directly to a sort of self-centered human action, which is trying to transcend by finding something that doesn't just reduce to the individual or the self, trying to find the universal, trying to find the essence. And we saw that there was a, a back and forth involved in that, a whole set of steps, and there was no real reconciliation. And, and that's what we're seeing as a starting point for this, this new section, although things are going to unravel fairly quickly, as they always do. <laughs> Otherwise, there wouldn't be any phenomenological development to, to chart out. But what we see Hegel saying here is that we're now at this, this point where self-consciousness, which was the previous section, right? Reason, it's not as if reason is something fundamentally different from self-consciousness. We're talking about rational self-consciousness. So a, a growth in self-consciousness beyond just the you know, play of master and slave and the dialectic of recognition and stoicism, skepticism, and unhappy consciousness into this, this new, broader you know, approach to things. And one of the things that, that Hegel said at the very beginning of the reason section is that with reason, self-consciousness comes to recognize that it is, at least in some respect, uh, 
all reality. And it lost sight of that in the observing reason section. And it, it lost sight of it and was very troubled by it, uh, even to the point of, of, as we saw, madness and, or frenzy with the law of the heart. Um, and then, you know, the way of the world conquering virtue in, in, in some respects, although, as we saw, they, those kind of get evened out at the end. Neither one really uh, wins out. Um, we don't have a, a, a full reconciliation, what, what Hegel here is calling a fulfillment, uh, erfulung, um, things actually being integrated. Uh, it's also, he's got Durchdringung here. Uh, interfusion is how um, Miller is translating it. So uh, there's, there's a lot going on in this section. Some of it is up here on the board. Some of it I'll just explain as we go through it. So he says, self-consciousness has now grasped what? The notion, the begriff, the concept of itself, which was only our notion of it, so that in its certainty of itself, it is all reality. And then he says, what has it been striving after? Well, end, zvek, purpose, goal, and essence, vesen, right? End and essence are for it, and here's where this, this big schema comes up, Henceforth, the spontaneous, or the, you might say, not conditioned by something else, sich bewegende, you know, moving itself, choosing, choosing itself, if you like, the uh, spontaneous interfusion, the Durchdringung, of uh, the universal and individuality. Now, notice what universal is being construed as here. It's a little bit different than it was back in the virtue and the way of the world discussion where these things, gifts, capacities, talents were, so to speak, thrown in the center between the universal, which was virtue, and the individual who is to subordinate him or herself uh, in, in his egoism, in her selfishness, self-centeredness to the universal, engaging in a kind of self-abnegation, using their gifts and capacities and talents for the purpose of the universal in modern virtue. Now, these have become the universal itself. Um, and we're gonna see this continue into the next section. So he says, the individual moments of this fulfilling, erfüllung, and interfusion, prior to the unity in which they've coalesced in, in the previous sections, are the ends hitherto considered. Right? There were purposes, there were ends that we were, we were working through. Now notice what he says after this. These have vanished. Why have they vanished? Well, they haven't completely vanished. It's not as if they're totally gone from the scene, but they have been assimilated. They have been integrated. Reason has a different attitude towards them at this point in the, the, the study than it did just earlier. Why? Because they're abstractions and chimeras belonging to those, as he calls it, first shallow shapes of spiritual self-consciousness. What does that mean? The initial stages of reason. Um, or also, you know, stoicism, skepticism, unhappy consciousness as well. So he says, they have their truth only in the imaginary being of the heart or in imagination and rhetoric. They do not have their being in reason. That doesn't mean that they've completely gone away. Um, we're going to see that they're going to keep on coming up as, as motifs later on. Um, we're going to see references to them, even in this, this very section. But they, they no longer can be seen as, you might say, viable shapes of consciousness in and, and, and on their own. So he says, um, reason now being absolutely certain of its reality no longer seeks only to realize itself as an end, here's, here's the key transition, in an antithesis to the reality which immediately confronts it, but on the contrary has the category as such for the object of its consciousness. Now, when you say category, of course, that brings to mind for, I think, most readers, uh, whether they've actually read Kant or not, uh, because they've learned something about Kant and the categories of the understanding, this brings to mind a, a sort of Kantian perspective on things. 
And I've cautioned against reading too much of that in here because it's not as if Kant is the only person to talk about categories. Aristotle has a whole work called The Categories, right? But it is kind of uh, useful here, I think. Why? If you think about what the Kantian, you know, the so-called so Copernican revolution uh, in, in philosophy uh, carried out by Kant is supposed to be, it's that we turn away from the objects of the world and thinking about how they must condition the way in which we perceive or grasp or act upon or, or desire or whatever uh, them. And we look instead at the subject and we focus on what the subject brings to the party. And there's, there's you know, here's sort of a thumbnail sketch of, of Kant we're projecting out onto whatever reality Wirklichkeit is, we're projecting you know, the ways in which reality has to present itself to us. So we're very active whether we realize it or not, and we use the categories of the understanding as ways to make sense of whatever the hell this is, this, this object or set of objects or object writ large, you know, with capital O, um, we are essentially bringing <clears throat> those to bear. Now, Hegel tends to talk about category in the singular, notice. He's already talked about category several times in terms of what it is that reason is grasping in working on understanding itself in relation to reality. So when he's talking about category here, what you should keep in mind is he's saying reason is in a certain sense. He's not actually saying reason is all reality. This isn't a solipsism. But um, reason is connected with, with everything that is real, that is wirklich, that, that has presence, reality, actuality. So um, why, is this, why is this fundamentally different? Well, if we go on, and we, we'll come back to that passage in a second, but it says, in other words, self-consciousness determined as being for itself or as the negative self-consciousness in which reason first made its appearance is set aside. We're putting aside um, self-consciousness as something in itself, as something purely negative in relation to reality. Why? This self-consciousness came face to face with a reality supposedly the negative of it. But that was a mistake, as it turns out. Or not necessarily a mistake, a necessary transition point that we had to get beyond in order to get to here. We had to realize that we have been behind the show the whole time. And if you want to think about this in terms of, you know, subconscious, unconscious, what you know, Hegel talks about, you know, reason or spirit working behind its back and, and, and consciousness is back. That, that's really how he, he does uh, view things. So there's always more going on than uh, consciousness realizes until the final stage. So he says, um, since end and intrinsic being have proved to be, intrinsic being is an sich sein, right? Uh, have proved to be the same as being for another, and the reality confronting it, here, here's a key upshot. Truth is no longer separated from or cut off from certainty. We, see, we start with, with certainty, and then we, over and over again in the Hegelian dialectic, try to get a hold of the truth of that certainty. In the process, grasping the truth, we often lose the certainty. And they're like, oh, man, I want to get that back, right? It's like somebody trying to juggle five different balls at the same time. And eventually, we want to have both of these together. We want to have uh, a self-certainty that is indeed its own truth. So he says, um, truth is no longer separated, no matter whether the proposed end is taken as certainty of self and the realization of it as truth or whether the end is taken for truth and the reality for certainty. Whatever is going to count as truth and certainty, we're bringing them back to, together at this point. So he says, intrinsic being an end uh, in and for itself are the certainty of immediate reality itself. And again, he uses this term interfusion, the interfusion of being in itself and being for itself of the universal and individuality. Now, notice what he talks about next action. 
So the previous section uh, of, of the, the entire reason portion of the text was all about action. It was all about essentially practical reason, right? We're still doing that. We're still involved with action here. This is still the realm of the practical. And he says, action is in its own self, its truth and reality. And individuality is in its setting forth or expression is in relation to action, the end in and for itself. So what is going on here? We, we think oftentimes of action as what a person does because he or she wants to uh, achieve a certain end. And it could be, you know, very, something very trivial. Um, you know, in philosophy of action, sometimes we use the example of whistling to oneself, you know, <laughs> walking around, and somebody says, what are, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just whistling. And he says, why are you whistling? So that's asking about the end. What, what's the goal of that? And then the person thinks, I don't know, I'm just whistling, you know. And they might say, I'm bored, or I like to whistle, or it's something that I do when I'm thinking about things and not paying attention. Um, or it could be something you know, very momentous. Why did you move across country? Well, because I needed to take this job. Why? Because that job would advance my career. Why did you do that? Because I'm trying to climb the ladder, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What Hegel's talking about here doesn't preclude purpose of action of that sort. But there's also a sense in which action, action's purpose is to be found within the person, the individual, figuring out who the hell he or she is or what indeed they are, coming to terms with themselves. Why are you whistling? I don't know. My dad used to whistle and maybe I'm at the stage in my life where I'm imitating him. What, what the hell is that about? And you start probing deeper, right? Or there could be all sorts of other things as well. I'm just sort of making that up as an example. But action can be, it can be an ongoing revelation of what it is that we are. And that is part of what self-conscious reason is striving after. With this notion of itself, therefore, self-consciousness has returned into itself out of these opposed determinations, which the category had for it and which characterized the relation of the self-consciousness to the category in its observational and also active roles. It has for its object the pure category itself, or it is the category which has become aware of itself. Its account with its previous shapes is thereby closed. They lie forgotten behind it and no longer confronted as a world given to it, but are developed solely within itself as transparent moments. Yet, they still fall apart within its consciousness as a movement of distinct moments, a movement which has not yet brought them together into their substantial unity. But, in all these moments, self-consciousness holds fast to the simple unity of objective being and the self a unity which is its genus. What is the upshot of this new position or this new attitude of rational self-consciousness? Well, Hegel is going to spell that out for us a little bit more in this next paragraph, number 395. And he's going to contrast um, one way of being connected with or really being bound up with the category and another way, that of the, the previous two sections and that which is going on, or at least at the very beginning of this, this new section. Uh, you know, things are going to get a lot more complicated very quickly, as they, they always do. Um, but at, at least here, we've got some sort of unity that was lacking in the past. So he says, with this notion of itself, the notion that was referred to in the previous paragraph... Uh, the notion of itself as, in, in some sense, being all reality, or at least being connected with all reality. Self-consciousness has returned into itself out of those opposed determinations which the category had for it. 
Um, opposed determinations being, you know, examples like the um, observer and the observed, uh, pleasure and the being who is being pleased, and then the necessity that confronts them, the actor and reality, all these, these things that have been, in some sense, uh, set into opposition, or Hegel often used this term antithesis with each other. And he says that this is the way that, that things have been fundamentally set up for consciousness in the two previous you know, sets of de developments, um, the observational and active roles of reason. Those are the two previous sections, obser observing reason and active reason, right? Or if we like the word practical reason, although this is also going to be practical reason. So he says, um, these characterize the relation of self-consciousness to the category in these, these roles. Now, what's different? He says, it has for its object, self-consciousness, has for its object the pure, reine, category itself, selbst, right? So in a certain sense, it's now grasp. It's not as if this is a different category than these categories. Category is not something like a being, which you could set, you know, them all out in a row like each other. You know, you might be thinking about Kant's table of the categories, but again, um, categories don't really work like like objects in that worldly sense, right? They're supposed to be these overarching things that we're using to make sense out of uh, the reality. So he says, um, self-consciousness has for its object, it's Gegenstand, the pure category itself. Now notice what he says after this. Or it is the category which has become aware of itself. So what does this mean? This means that we don't want to say that self-consciousness itself is a category, but in a certain sense it is or it has become a category that is self-aware. Self-consciousness, self-aware category, it becomes its own object. We've, we've gone through all of this discussion way back in the self-consciousness section, of course. Um, but now things are getting more complex, but they're supposed to be being unified at this point. So he says, its account, this is where it gets really interesting, its account with the previous shapes is thereby closed. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that we have here reached a historical transition point and going forward, all self-consciousness uh, or all rational self-consciousness can no longer connect at all with those previous shapes of consciousness that we spent so much time and labor observing and going along with and seeing the ups and downs and the dialectical development. No, it doesn't mean that at all. And they're not being thrown away into the dustbin of history. But they're no longer accessible in the same way. They're no longer, we could say, live possibilities. To, to take them on would be to go backwards in a certain respect. So he says they no longer confront it as a world given to it, but they're developed solely, notice, they're still developed solely within itself as transparent moments. Where? In something like this, in, in an account that, that encompasses them and transcends them, you know, sublates them. Now notice what he says. He says they still fall apart within its consciousness as a movement of distinct moments, a movement which has not yet brought them together in their substantial unity. That, that's actually going to happen later on in the work. Uh, but in these movements, he says, self-consciousness holds fast to the simple unity of objective being and the self, a unity which is its genus. Right? So there, there is some advance that has taken place here. And this is a unity of these previous shapes, a integration, if you like, of them. Um, he doesn't use the word Aufhebung here, but that's really what is going on. In so doing, consciousness has cast away all opposition and every condition affecting its action. 
It starts afresh from itself and is occupied not with an other, but with itself. Since individuality is in its own self-actuality, the material of its efforts and the aim of action lie in the action itself. Action has, therefore, the appearance of the movement of a circle which moves freely within itself in a void, which unimpeded now expands, now contracts, and is perfectly content to operate in and for its own self. The element in which individuality sets forth its shape has the significance solely of putting on the shape of individuality. It is the daylight in which consciousness wants to dis display itself. Action alters nothing and opposes nothing. It is the pure form of a transition from a state of not being seen to one of being seen, and the content which is brought out into the daylight and displayed is nothing else but what this action already is in itself. It is implicit. This is its form as a unity in thought, and it is actual. This is its form as an existent unity. Action itself is a content only when, in this determination of simplicity, it is contrasted with its character as a transition and movement. Hegel makes some very interesting remarks that are clarifications about, about action at this point in paragraph 396, which brings this very short introductory section to a close and gets us ready to jump into the spiritual animal kingdom. Right? It sounds quite interesting, doesn't it? Uh, and trust me, it is. So he, he says, um, in so doing, consciousness cast away all opposition and every condition affecting its action. Uh, why, why would it have done that? Well, you remember that um, one of the key realizations that we had at the end of the previous section with virtue in the way of the world was that action had now become something which, in, in a certain sense, transcended the, these previous determinations. Hegel is talking about consciousness now being concerned with action, as we might say, per se, right? Now, th this doesn't mean that every single action of the individual at this, this point is of this sort, but all we really have to have is some fundamental actions in which it, it is meeting these conditions. It is, it is understanding, coming to, to grasp itself through its own action and no longer in opposition to something else, some other condition that would be out there, some other reality that the action is supposed to penetrate into and in a, in a respect, uh, you know, lose itself or, or transform itself through acting on, on that reality and the consciousness itself. Here, like he says, it's a cast away all oppositions and every condition affecting its action. It starts afresh from what? From itself. And it is not occupied with an other but itself. You might say, well, th this is really terrible. Now, you know, the Hegelian subject has become a navel gazer. It's only interested in its action insofar as it affects itself. What about others? Well, you know, remember, it's already gone through these painful transitions in the law of the heart and virtue, right? In, in just a little bit earlier. And it's lost the ethical, <laughs> the ethical substance in its society that it was still looking for. I didn't get it back yet. Um, so, you know, there's still a lot to be developed here. So he says, since individuality is in its own self actuality, this is what we discovered at the very end, right? Um, and the material of its efforts, the stuff, and the aim of its action, the end, the zvek, I don't know why he... Miller is, you know, changing the terminology here. And, Zvek, the same thing that we've been looking at the entire time, lies in the action itself. Now, this, this, is, this schema is not representing this all that well because we do have, like, a transition here. Individuality, action is coming from it. But we wanted to represent that actuality is there for individuality and the end is there in the action. This is what we call praxis, right? If we're using older categories like Aristotelian ones. So he goes on and he says, um, action has, therefore, the appearance of the movement of a circle which now moves freely within itself in a void. 
Notice what he says after that. So not only is it sort of on its own engaging in this, this constant motion. I know there's somebody out there who's going to bring up the Uruburus, you know, and, and I suppose you could at this point, provided that it's actually in movement. But notice that it's not just a circular motion. It can expand itself or collapse itself as much as it wishes to. What determines that? The individuality, and I suppose the kind of action that it's engaged in. So, you know, if uh, playing marbles all day, if you, you can actually get away with that, is <laughs> where your heart lies, um, I think that's a fairly condensed action. If uh, reading, um, you know, uh, the entirety of one of the great wisdom traditions is your bag instead, well, that's going to be a much larger project now, isn't it, right? Uh, you might go to the gym and work out, uh, change your body to fit a certain type. Uh, maybe you decide that your action is you're going to become a chef and you go off to you know, learn uh, culinary techniques. And then you start just practicing them over and over and over again. Culinary education, by the way, is a great example of something that you can, in fact, only learn adequately by some doing, by some tun, by some, some performance. So he goes on and he says, um, the element in which individuality sets forth its shape, now he's got all these interesting visual metaphors, has a significance solely of putting on the shape of individuality. It is the daylight in which consciousness wants to display itself. Now, display itself to who? He doesn't actually say here, does he? That's an interesting question that you should think about. Because I think the answer is going to change as we proceed through this section. Now, he goes on and he says, the action alters nothing and opposes nothing. It doesn't really seem like much of action if, if that's really the case. But see where he's going. He says, it's the pure form of a transition from a state of not being seen to one of being seen. And the content, the inhalt, which it is brought out into the daylight and displayed, is nothing else but what this action already is in itself. Action is a way to go from not being seen, nicht uh, gesicht werden, right? Yeah, I think, uh, to gesicht uh, werden, being seen. Being seen by who, though, we still have to ask. Certainly by the individuality itself. Perhaps by others? Well, we'll see. I mean, when we get into the next section, that is going to become a concern for, for individuality, for rational self-consciousness. But right now, let's just say that it is for itself. In carrying out its action, it discovers what it is. It brings its latency, you might say, out of darkness into the sunshine, if we're going to use the metaphor here that Hegel has. And he says, it is implicit. The action is implicit. This is its form as a unity in thought, and it is actual. This is its form as an existent unity. So what have we got going on here? Action itself is a content only when, in this determination of simplicity, it is contrasted with its character as a transition and movement. So notice, we were, we were talking about everything being a unity just a little bit ago, and now Hegel is starting to separate things out again, isn't he? And once we have separation, we're going to have relation between those, those terms and something like action will break up into different aspects of itself, which might be opposed to each other. And there's going to be some interesting dialectical developments. But I think this is a, a great place to get ready for the transition now to the spiritual animal kingdom, particularly with this metaphor of action as a way of moving, a way of transitioning from not being seen to, to being seen.